Hi, and welcome to Mindset Mondays. I'm Dr. Deborah Dupree, the Mindset Doc, and I'm delighted to bring to you another yet thought leader, well versed in the area of law and particularly in the area of workers' compensation. You might wonder, well, why workers' compensation? Well, we have a lot going on in today's COVID-19 world, and we're going to take a look at what have we learned from the past. This isn't our first rodeo, uh, but also what can we, how can we use this information from past experiences to guide us moving forward into 2021? And so with that, I'm delighted to have here today, Elliot Herland, an attorney from Minnesota. Welcome, Elliot. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Doctor. Well, thank you, Elliot. And uh, Elliot, you know, we've worked together before because you were part of our Agile Lawyer Mediator Life Series, soon to be released. And so, um, and Elliot was one of those, uh, uh, you know, leaders in the field, shall we say, who made that transition, not just from being a highly educated and experienced lawyer, but into the field of mediation and how to use his skill set and mindset differently to help people reach resolutions. So Elliot, we're looking forward to getting that released soon. Yes, thank you. Yes, I'll be yes. sure to promote it. <laughs> okay, great, great, great. Well, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned that um, people from many walks of life can actually gain, whatever their profession is, and how it does take a different mindset uh, to show up as a mediator in uh, a different way of looking at things. And so I'm always uh, enthusiastic and passionate about uh, uh, exposing people to the field of mediation and what a difference it can make in um, our life choices. Yeah, I enjoy mediation much better than litigation. That's that's certainly, that's where my joy is. Yes, I, I can identify with that because when I was first uh, exposed to mediation way back in the early 90s, I said, oh my gosh, I found my passion here. So uh, again, it's, it's helping people work through um, difficulties into resolution. So Elliot, before we get started with our program today, uh, what I'd like to do is tell our viewers and listeners a little bit about your background to demonstrate your expertise and your world of knowledge that you bring here to us today. Okay. okay? Okay, great. So, so uh, Elliot, as I mentioned, is a, a lawyer in Minnesota and uh, hails from my home state. And he graduated from William Mitchell College of Law in 1984 and spent his early career as a litigator until 1997. And he has been active in the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry, as well as Workers' Compensation Division, and um, now as a mediator arbitrator up through 2004. Well, beyond that, he went into union construction workers' comp programs and uh, more dispute resolution. And then he started his own Erlin Mediation Services in 2004 and um, has active, actively been uh, mediating cases both in person by telephone and online, as many um, uh, mediators have had to pivot since COVID-19. Indeed. Yes. And what we're finding is that mediation online is actually very effective too. Wouldn't you agree? I love it. I love it. Uh, other than Zoom fatigue, yeah. uh, which, I'm, which I'm learning to deal with, I'm sure you have many patients coming to you now with Zoom fatigue. Yes, absolutely. And so there are things that we can do to uh, help prevent that and manage it uh, more effectively, too. Uh, so just like uh, Elliot's here today as part of our Thought Leader program uh, on Mindset Mondays, he's also a continuing um, legal education speaker on topics of alternate dispute resolution or what we oftentimes call ADR or simply DR um, in Minnesota's workers' comp systems. And he's long been a member of the American Bar Association and the dispute resolution section. So world, wealth of knowledge and world of expertise. So thank you, Elliot. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, always a delight to have uh, really experienced people with me here today. And um, I also know that you uh, are an Eagle Scout. Yes, I am. <laughs> and I think we've talked before that uh, um, you, you like I have, uh, although I wasn't an Eagle Scout, but I had brothers who were, um, uh, the Boy Scout camp along um, the Mississippi River. What is it? Um, Lake, uh, uh, what is it? Oh, is it Camp Hoaxala? Yes, there in, we go. Uh, in Lake City? Yes. Uh, on, on Lake Pepin. There we go. Thank you. Part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great memories there. Yeah, beautiful area, beautiful area. So, mm -hmm. uh, and that you've also been in a rock band. Uh, yes, I have. Oh. I am. You know, uh, I'm a bass player. Wow. Do you I still... also sing backup. Oh. But they keep telling me to back up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, very good. Well, yeah, certainly a very interesting background. I, I do find 
there is a common theme among uh, uh, people in the legal profession is they oftentimes have those very creative outlets like we need singing them. or playing in bands and things like that. So, so yeah. it's nice to know that side of you a little bit differently than just the legal side. Mm. Well, thanks for uh, uh, getting me out there like that. Yeah. <laughs> Very good, yes. Well, one of the things, Elliot, that I wanted to learn from your perspective, um, I know that California, you know, is often viewed as being sort of a leader in a lot of uh, legal rights areas, but Minnesota is a, a close second, if not even a first, many times. And, and it's been that way for quite a long time. And so uh, I wanted to get your perspective, you know, in terms of, you know, where are we in the world of, you know, diseases and COVID-19 and what have we learned from other pandemics or um, infectious disease uh, uh, experiences from the past and just what's happening uh, in today's work world as we're dealing with all these different kinds of conditions. And so, first of all, I guess, how would you define um, what is an occupational disease? Oh, well, that's a, a very good question. First, what is an occupation? That, well, seem, that seems easy, but when it comes to diseases, you start thinking about doctors with, and, and other healthcare professionals that are exposed to all sorts of uh, dangerous things. Certainly COVID has exposed them to a very serious uh, condition, but there are people in the construction industry, mm -hmm. uh, housekeepers, uh, people in the service industry, uh, of course, we in the legal industry, uh, Barbers, stylists are all, all kinds of uh, careers expose you to potential diseases. So uh, then the, the question then becomes is what, what is a disease? And of course, each state has a different definition mm -hmm. of what a disease is. But, uh, you know, the difference be between a disease and an accident uh, something falls on you or you lift something up or you're working overhead and you injure yourself uh, in joints and hands and wrists, uh, those can also lead to a disease. Mm -hmm. and, and so a disease, I think most people think of a disease as an exposure to something. Mm -hmm. And I made a list. Okay. For instance, uh, x-rays and hair dyes and latex and pesticides. You see on TV uh, about asbestosis, uh, exposure to asbestos and silicosis, mm -hmm. which is silica and uh, the cancers, mesothelioma that you get from those types of exposures. Uh, heat and cold though, here in Minnesota, there's frostbite. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and, but there's also heat. Uh, in the summer, it can get really hot. Uh, psychological trauma, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, heart conditions. Uh, there are presumptions on those types of things for certain occupations like police officers and other first responders. Uh, but there's also a disease that doesn't come from exposure to that type of stuff. It's vibrations. Mm. Uh, for instance, jackhammers or nail guns or uh, typing or staring at a computer screen all day. Uh, repetitive trauma, overuse, uh, carpet layers oftentimes get bad knees, cement workers. When you're on your hands and knees, even with the protection and safety that people take, you can get minute, discrete trauma that over time adds up and creates an injury and <clears throat> an injury is just if your definition of disease is broad enough it includes uh orthopedic type problems like that i remember back in the 1990s <clears throat> um shortly after i moved to the san diego area uh one of my um clients was uh teledyne ryan and you know they they um, they built the uh, drones, and uh, and so one of the common areas was like you were talking about the vibrational types of injuries from using rivet guns, and right. yeah, and so we did a lot to look at ergonomics as well as different types of padding and and things like that, frequency of breaks to try to reduce the frequency of injuries, um, and so lots of people oftentimes associate 
competitive motion kinds of things with office typing kinds of jobs, but actually there are certain occupations that have long held, had um, those kinds of exposures that uh, we oftentimes don't hear about, like the meat, meat cutting industry or like oh. carpet layers, you know, and things like that. Well, meat cutting comes into play with COVID, mm. but we'll talk about that, I'm sure, in a little bit. A little teaser there. Yes, there we go. There we go. So, um, you know, there, like you said, there is a really broad range of, of, you know, what could be considered an occupational disease. And so um, I'm not going to get into the complexities of, of um, you know, proving it or, and so forth. Uh, I know we're going to talk a little bit about a burden of proof, um, but it, it is complex. And, and particularly under today's circumstances, uh, it's um, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unpredictability about um, what's happening and so forth. Right. And, and it affects a mediator's ability to assist parties in reaching settlement. And in fact, sometimes settlement is not what you want to reach. You want to reach the conclusion that no, this probably should just sit, or maybe it needs to go to trial mm -hmm. because the differences of the way each party looks at the exposure is valid mm -hmm. yes and that's those are those are hard bridges to gap or gaps to bridge yeah. uh, uh especially uh now with this covid being a pandemic versus something discreet within the industry like hair dye mm -hmm. for the hairstylist and the types of uh, reactions you can have to constant exposure to hair dye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know we'll we'll get into a little bit further as far as underlying conditions. So I know that's one of the areas that I'm uh, you know currently facing as a mediator and trying to you know helping people as as businesses reopen, helping people get back to work to perform the work, you know, and how much remote work can actually be. Um, it's tolerable and uh, not all jobs can be entirely performed from remote working while others are easily accomplished by remote working. So I know businesses here, as I imagine in many parts of the country are, are facing a lot of rethinking, you know, how we do work, where we do work and, and um, uh, what can we get accomplished. And so I'm curious uh, from uh, from your perspective, being a, an attorney mediator in Minnesota, um, mm -hmm. what are just, you know, three or four key points about the workers' compensation system in Minnesota that might be same or, or different than how we practice here in California? Well, <clears throat> back here is a really big book, <laughs> and, and that's called the Minnesota Workers' Compensation Desk Book, which is authored by a, a, a lot of uh, prominent attorneys here in the state of Minnesota. That's not the law. That's how uh, we lawyers interpret uh, the law. Um, and, and each state is very different. I know in California, you now have a presumption with regard to COVID. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe our state has done that yet. There's, uh, there, there hasn't been any discussion that I'm aware of. Uh, there are certain presumptions, like I mentioned, with regard to police officers and firefighters uh, and healthcare workers, th those uh, areas of occupations. Um, is that is that kind of where where you're looking? Yeah, and so I, I know that you're a contributor to that big book in the back there. <laughs> And so uh, highlight what, what your area of contribution was so we can sort of understand a little bit more about your expertise and again, the workers' compensation system. Oh, well, uh, I helped uh, co-author a part of the book dealing with the collectively bargained work comp system, which uh, in this instance dealt with the union construction industry. Uh, and so it was a, a a carve out is what they're called and the the system is subject to the same laws but the process is different it's more focused toward adr uh some people like it a lot and some people mm -hmm. don't like it at all mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but it requires a knowledge of both uh that specific industry but also uh you have to know the 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 law in general with mm -hmm. regard to work comp mm 
Yeah. And in this case, we're talking about the occupational disease portion of the statute. Okay. And the development of that law is interesting because uh, it goes all the way back to the 20s and mm -hmm. changes that were made in the 40s and in the 70s and even as recent as in the, the 2000s when uh, purely psychological uh, problems were recognized as compensable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Before you needed to have uh, some sort of physical component uh, to the psychological injury, either it was a, a psych, uh, a, a mental physical, so the mental disorder resulted in a physical disorder, or mm -hmm. a physical injury resulted in a psychological injury. Okay. Yeah. Now you can have what's called a mental mental. Uh, uh, which specifically is post-traumatic stress disorder. And now we're getting in a little bit too deep in the weeds of the law, I think. Okay. For our purposes, unless you want me to keep going. No, I think we, we <laughs> I don't want to go down that the rabbit hole, shall we say, right now. Um, yeah. Because there are some other points that I want to make sure that we cover before we um, uh, wrap our program today. And so what would you say are some of the challenges, you know, when you look at the complexities of the workers' comp law, um, regardless of the state, and certainly evidenced by your big book back there, um, what, what are some of the challenges that parties oftentimes face um, in, in making a claim, and then where does the dispute resolution actually fit in, uh, you know, in the whole process? Okay, so how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the first step is knowing that you've even been injured, mm -hmm. and, and then providing notice to the employer that you have this condition, mm -hmm. uh, but then you've got the causation threshold mm -hmm. showing that it was caused at work a, a while back uh, i did a, a mediation mm -hmm. involving someone who contracted west nile virus from a mosquito bite mm -hmm. uh, well now if you were someone who was involved in mosquito eradication mm -hmm. and walking through swamps maybe you could get over the hurdle yeah probably got west nile virus but this person was a construction worker and sure there's a lot of mosquitoes here in minnesota uh, but he also lived in a house right next to a swamp oh. so chances are west nile virus came somewhere other than at work and that's a, a that's a big hurdle showing that it's work related also showing that it's not just an aggravation of a pre-existing condition for instance, psychological injuries. If someone has an underlying psychological condition of depression, and then they become more depressed because of an injury that they've had, well, is that a temporary aggravation or a permanent aggravation? And now we have COVID. Okay. And where did you get COVID? Did you work in an industry where there was a breakout in the plant? Uh, I recently did some COVID mediation involving a plant that had a huge breakout of COVID. Uh, and so those people could probably overcome the causation, but questions came up. Uh, who's in your house? You got any teachers in there? Have you been to the grocery store? Have you been out to a uh, a recreational event have you been to a wedding have you been to a funeral some super spreader have you been to a political rally uh you know all all sorts of other possible sources but let's say you get past the causation now i would think certain people like uh the ones in the industries i'm talking about and and our first responders uh those heroes in the hospital that are dealing with these outbreaks Certainly, we can assume that they got COVID from their work. Mm -hmm. All right, so we got causation. Mm -hmm. Now, what's compensable? And this is where those six mediations involving COVID, why it f failed to reach a settlement, but didn't fail because we learned something mm -hmm. about those cases. So there was still 
success as long as you make sure you don't define success in mediation as settlement, mm -hmm. which it, which is really hard to do because mm -hmm. that's what we think, especially yeah. us mediators, we want settlements. But anyway, in well, the let me just add to that for a second, Elliot, because I know um, having, you know, been a mediator myself for nearly 30 years, uh, but also having taught uh, professionals like lawyers to become um, in my, at least in my case, workplace mediators, um, that I think this has been pretty consistent is that mediation as a, as a whole uh, tends to be very successful a good 80 to 90 percent of the time. And I think I've even heard higher figures of late. Um, and that even when cases don't reach, um, well, being a non-attorney, I don't call them settlements, I call them agreements or reaching solutions um, uh, or conclusions, um, that even when um, you know, a, a, a mediated agreement is not reached, parties still report a high degree of satisfaction with the process right. because of the ability to finally talk about, you know, the, their underlying concerns and, and fears and, and perceptions about the facts involved. And, uh, and so, like you said, a lot is learned through the process and, um, and uh, you know, a, a much greater, deeper understanding is available that we didn't have before. Now, the question would be is how is that used outside of the mediated, me, mediation process? And one of the views I have about mediation is that it's not mine. Hmm. It's there, it's the parties. And uh, I'm there to facilitate and help the parties, uh, sometimes having them in separate rooms so that when they say nasty things about each other, I can rephrase it. Mm -hmm and help and support the process but still you're right uh i've managed to witness people have very successful outcomes uh, in resolution or solution and sometimes the solution is uh not to resolve the litigation uh, sometimes the solution is to just stay in the work comp system to keep the claim alive or some portion of it um, or to go to trial which may occur in many COVID cases and it's not just the people that catch the disease mm -hmm. but what about and I was thinking about this the other day what about the people that are working remotely not because they wanted to mm -hmm. but because they had to because of this pandemic and, and they don't like being alone mm -hmm. and the uh, the psychological effects of that. And I, I don't know if that's a compensable situation or not. Also, what about when your coworker has COVID and maybe it's so bad that they die? Mm -hmm. Now you've got a survivor situation and you know how survivors can sometimes have guilt Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder what happens there. Uh, but the other hurdle in COVID cases is what's it worth? Yeah. Um, e even if it was compensable, how much medical treatment do you need? Mm -hmm. I, now, if someone dies, of course, we've got a pretty big case. Uh, but if all you do is get tested, you have it, you've got some medical treatment maybe, you're out of work for 14 days, but the employers tend to give you some pay for that anyway. And now you're better, or at least we think you're better. We don't know. I mean, like exposure to asbestos. Mm -hmm. You don't develop cancer or mesothelioma, which is what we see on TV quite a bit, yeah. um, for years to come. And that was one of the challenges in this, these uh, mediations that I did involving COVID is uh, the, the insurer was willing to offer $500 for your COVID case, while the employee's attorney said, well, what happens if this person has lung disease in the future? What if 
they have some other problems with their organs because we don't really know what COVID is going to do to the human body long term. Absolutely. And that's that goes back to, you know, the, the terms I keep hearing and say frequently myself is the uncertainty and unpredictability. You know, every day, I mean, it's really been sort of a roller coaster these last few months because every day we learn something different about the the um, uh, the disease itself. Every day we learn more about the symptoms. Every day we learn more about, you know, uh, is, is there actually um, immunity or not? Uh, and, you know, are there going to be longer term conditions? And, you um, it, it seems that while there may be some patterns, there's still a lot of case by case kinds of situations because so much may be impacted by underlying conditions about whether or not you develop any ongoing symptomology or long term effects of it. And, and that's, I think, the difficult part for a lot of people is just uncertain and unpredictable right now. We don't know. We know a lot more than we did back in March, but we certainly don't know enough yet. No, we don't. No, we don't. And we don't know what the long term uh, term effects mm -hmm. of this disease are going to be, which is why I wasn't upset about the cases not settling and neither were the parties. Mm -hmm. In fact, I got a note, an email from the claims adjuster uh, thanking me for the work. Even uh, one, I'm not used to getting <laughs> that, but because usually maybe they think they paid too much, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, uh, she said, thank you for the work that you did on these uh, unusual cases. Uh, even though they didn't settle, we learned something. And uh, I think that was important. Uh, and I certainly enjoyed getting the note. Yeah. <laughs> Bit of a relief for me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that is a relief. Um, and I think you know, as I've talked to you know other um, you know my employer base or the, some of the attorneys and uh, mediators um, that I you know I work with is that you know again trying to take a look at well you know what can we draw upon past experiences uh, as i said earlier you know this isn't our first rodeo and so um you know it's not that this is the first time we've been confronted with a pandemic uh, or other you know kinds of um, diseases or events in the world that have impacted our ability to be at work stay at work and perform the work and so what can we draw upon you know other situations and um it's um I think I was mentioning earlier that I had mediated a case a couple of weeks ago where the employee's perception about being her success in working from home was very different about the employer's perception and the impact it was having given the purpose of that job. And uh, there were essential functions that were impacted. It may not seem big to the onlooker, um, but for the person for which the job was designed to support, it was big because it was taking away from that person's ability to do um, her job effectively without the, the active support of this person in the workplace. Um, and what happens if the stress gets to the point of disease? Yeah. And would so, that be a compensable claim? Maybe in California. That's <laughs> an interesting know. point because, you know, right now that that's the thing about the person who's, who mm -hmm. is um, not getting the full support by this employee working remotely. She's under an incredible amount of stress. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, in fact, um, there was a point of, after the meeting where actually during the meeting, you could see the stress evident on her face and, um, you know, and getting quite emotional because uh, there was such a disconnect between the employee's perception and the employer's perception. And in that case, we, um, uh, we thought we'd successfully reached a, a resolution around a continued leave of, or I shouldn't say continued, um, inserting a leave of absence um, because of the employee's condition. and. And uh, the employee kept going back, well, my doctor said, and it's like, well, no, your do what your doctor says is very, very important. However, it's a balance between what the employer needs and what the employee needs. And in this case, you've already been accommodated for four months and it's not working. It's not working well for the employer. And so, um, you know, let's, let's give it some time through a paid leave of absence and see what, uh, what evolves with this COVID-19 and how well do we get it under control and, and um, reviewing the, the, the safety protocols put into place. Yeah, and you know, a lot of different laws come into play when I hear you talking about this case, the Americans with Disability Act, the Family Medical Leave Act, uh, the work comp laws. All of these things come into play uh, when we're dealing with 
workplace issues uh, and the effects that they can have. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, let's say this person gets so upset that they develop an ulcer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now we've got a physical manifestation of a mental condition. And that would be compensable in Minnesota if you could prove it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, without going to the weeds on that one, you know, um, again, taking a look at pre COVID functioning uh, versus, you know, in the midst of COVID functioning and then, you know, possibly comparing it to post COVID functioning, you know, and so that would be one way of looking at it. Um, as a psychologist, that's what I would be looking at is that, okay, where was the person functioning before and where's the person now? And um, again, for the employee in this situation, uh, she's had this condition, this underlying condition for many years and has worked successfully it's just now her condition doesn't allow her to be at work when everybody else in her job classification is at work and wow. uh, yeah and again she's already been accommodated for four months uh during the, you know during this period of transitioning back to opening the workplace fully which they haven't yet um and yet you know some essential workers are back on the line so so if she has for instance general anxiety disorder mm -hmm and uh, take some medication for it. And now her general anxiety disorder is being triggered by the situation. Well, her pre-existing condition is now either temporarily aggravated, mm -hmm. and is that gonna be covered by work comp? And do they end up wanting to settle and, and separate themselves as employer and employee? Um, those are the types of issues that we deal with in workers comp. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you, help people maintain the relationship of employer and employee in work comp that that's also a goal but sometimes the goal is to create that divorce mm -hmm. yes uh, the unentanglement of the employer who's having difficulty accommodating this person and the physical and mental conditions that make it difficult for the employment relationship to continue yes and sometimes that's just what is, you know, and I know, you know, for, like you said, I try to preserve the employee employer relationship. And so, um, you know, based on, you know, the research I've done and so forth, you know, we are actively looking at, you know, temporary accommodations until we have a better feel, you know, and, um, and using some of the existing guidelines we have around temporary accommodation and existing, you know, um, policies that employers have and, uh, and recognizing, you know, where the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission uh, at the federal level has said, you know, where exceptions can be made on a finite or discrete basis. And so um, I just had a conversation before we we started this as far as, um, you know, if, if we can do something, you know, in the next 30 days over November to return the person fully back to work, um, then that would be a viable extension of an existing accommodation. But if it means going another 90 days or 120 days, then that would extend the burden of um, or the undue hardship on the part of the employer. So all these things have to be balanced and considered. And so um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, ask you then, Elliot, is um, in the in the world of uh, your work in, in workers' comp and in Minnesota law, um, you know, what would you say are maybe the number one, two, or three challenges um, that uh, parties face in this uh, current COVID-19 world? Boy, uh, is there an injury of some sort? Uh, and what type of injury is it? And did it happen at work? And can you prove that it is a substantial contributing factor to causing aggravating or accelerating the condition? Those are the words of the statute. Uh, and then if you can get past that hurdle uh, and, and that you gave notice on time, uh, what are the damages and what's the compensability under the statute? What, you know, do you get wage loss benefits? Do you get medical benefits for this person? Let's say they can't go back to this work. They're going to need help with job search. They're going to need help. Maybe they need to be retrained into a different profession. There are all sorts of sticky wickets mm -hmm. out there in the work comp uh, field uh, with regard to 
not only this disease, uh, but I mean, we go back all the way to uh, HIV and uh, people getting needle pricks. And then who's going to pay for the test to see if they have it? Who's going to pay for the test uh, unless, you know, the governments take over the testing for uh, COVID-19? Uh, and what what are the exposures going to be for the employer? And how are the insurers going to underwrite this risk? Uh, because this is uh, this is uh, a much bigger deal uh, than Ebola, which is relatively small. H one N one, which wasn't as serious, uh, even though it was a pandemic, it wasn't as serious as this one. Uh, and certainly didn't have the effect on society as this one. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, go, you got to go all the way back to the early 1900s. And I don't know uh, how well work comp in Minnesota, it was 1911 when work comp came into existence. But uh, I don't know how mature it was as far as a law mm -hmm. and and how much practice it was getting yeah well i, I um uh, as the saying goes we've come a long way baby <laughs> in some instances yes yeah well i think recently you know are much more developed in our thought process and as well as our legal process and our employment practices than we were back then uh but again you know i just go back to you know this is a whole new ball game i mean it's not our first rodeo but this is a new ball game with new rules as it's a new ball it's a big bull. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so 2021 is going to be a, a year of um, ongoing thought process, uh, leveraging what we know, um, you know, creating new ways of looking at things, taking a look at what have we learned, um, you know, since uh, we really came, you know, head to head with um, COVID-19 back in March of 2020. And, and uh, uh, as I've said around a couple of different things, it's like even doing these Zoom meetings is that, you know, where we were back in March doing Zoom and where we are today is vastly different. And where we, will, where we are today will be very different from where we will be in six more months. Well, I'm having to wear my glasses a lot more <laughs> from eye strain. And I, I would imagine uh, between Zoom fatigue eye strain and uh, proper ergonomics, uh, we're going to have some issues. It'll be interesting to see the long-term effect of COVID-19 uh, on our population and our economy and, uh, and the legal consequences oh, yeah. that come from that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, Elliot, I'd like to um, ask you to share with our viewers and listeners, um, you know, if they were interested in contacting you further, how best to reach you? Uh, well, I have a website, mm -hmm. HerlandMediation.com, but uh, I don't mind taking uh, phone calls. Okay. Uh, so let me just first say um, Herland is H-E-R-L-A-N-D. Uh-huh. Okay. So HerlandMediation.com. Uh -huh. That's one way they can find you. And I imagine your phone number is on there as well as email. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And yes. Would you like to sh uh, share with our listeners what your phone number might be? Oh, sure. 952-240-4005. 952-240-4005. A friend of me, uh, mine taught me how to tell people my phone number, which is say it slowly mm -hmm. and then say it again. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We need to usually hear things more than once, that's for sure. Well, I know that there's much more we could uh, you know, keep talking about um, you know, in the world of workers' compensation, the implications of COVID-19, um, mm -hmm. other occupational diseases. And um, I think, it, uh, but in the interest of time, you know, uh, suffice it to say, um, the, the world will keep evolving in this direction and uh, we'll continue to learn more and more about how to manage these very important cases. Thanks so much for inviting me back. Always a pleasure to be interviewed by you and have a conversation with you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elliot. I appreciate it. And again, uh, Elliot, you know, has been part of our Agile Lawyer Mediator Life Series and where we actually have navigated through the lives of about a dozen professionals in that, that journey in becoming a lawyer, but also in their journey in making that transition to becoming a mediator. It is a different mindset, right, Elliot? Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank God it is. Yes, it is. It is. It's a whole new way of looking at things, right? I'm much better at being a peacemaker than I was at a warrior. <laughs> and that is, well, don't we all just want world peace, right? Some of us do. Okay. <laughs> a lot of us do. And we just need to you know, promulgate that along, right? Amen. Yep, great. Well, I want to thank our, our viewers and listeners again. This is Dr. Deborah Dupree, the Mindset Doc with Mindset Mondays. And again, our goal is to um, influence the, the minds of millions and to leverage your mindset differently to think about, you know, how you can approach life, um, learn, live and grow in a way that truly makes a difference in creating a healthier, happier and more prosperous life. Dr. Deborah Dupree, the Mindset Doc. Don't forget to breathe. Very good. Take a deep breath. Amen.